Some estimates indicate that up to 5 million people may have died in the Korean War of the early 1950s. Such is the cost of miscalculation, both on the part of the Communist bloc, which went into this war wanting to test the American primacy that was taking shape after the Second World War, and the United States, which by massively disarming after World War II, weakened its power in the perception of its opponents, mainly the USSR. Let's look at the last war in which the current strategic rivals, Beijing and Washington, fought directly against each other. Welcome to another episode in the series, Lessons of the Past. This episode's partner is NordVPN. The cybernetic network is one of the fastest growing domains of competition between world powers. However, the fight is also on the individual level, for my privacy or yours. VPN will help you cover your digital footprint on the internet and NordVPN offers the best value for money in the market. By purchasing NordVPN from the link in the description, you support the development of good times, bad times. Communist Front Taiwan and South Korea are irrelevant to the security of the United States. Secretary of State Dean Akison, January 1950 the USSR may take South Korea without US intervention, because it's of little value to the United States. Tom Connolly, Chairman of the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee in May of 1950. The reckless statements of leading US politicians are just one of the reasons why the Soviet Union felt confident in pursuing an increasingly bold foreign policy in Asia. Given the passive attitude of the West towards the coup in Prague in February of 1948, its defensive behavior towards the Berlin crisis, and most importantly, the lack of reaction to Chiang Kai-shek's defeat in China, it was reasonable to conclude that an equally favorable situation might not occur again. The leaders of the Soviet Union did not intend to lose such an opportunity. Determined steps were therefore taken to expand Soviet influence in Asia. On December 16, 1949, Mao Zedong made his first ever visit to Moscow, which resulted in the Soviet-Chinese Alliance Treaty, which was signed on February 14, 1950. Earlier, Korean Communist leader Kim Il-sung visited the Soviet Union and spoke with Joseph Stalin. Unfortunately, the details of this conversation remain a mystery. It is certain, however, that they discussed the invasion of South Korea. According to Nikita Khrushchev, who revealed some facts, the invasion, quote, was proposed not by Stalin, but by Kim Il-sung. He, so to speak, was the initiator of this move. Well, of course, Stalin did not stop him, because it suited both his views and his convictions as a communist. Everything seemed to play in favor of Stalin's policies and Kim Il-sung's ideas. They did not feel any threat. NATO was just beginning to form, and the Americans continued the post-war demobilization of their army, which was reduced from over 8 million in 1945 to about 670,000 by the early 1950s. Now at that time, Moscow had five times as many troops as Washington, an equal number of planes, and 30 armored divisions, compared to the United States remaining one. Their fear was also not aroused by the American garrison in neighboring Japan, because the American forces there numbered only 36,000 soldiers, and they were only supported by light tanks. The attack from the north. On June 25, 1950, Kim Il-sung's army invaded. 223,000 soldiers, 120 T-34 tanks, and 180 aircraft struck at dawn, capturing Seoul in just three days. And shortly thereafter, almost 90% of the territory of South Korea, whose troops, about 98,000 soldiers deprived of aviation, armor, and artillery support, were rapidly overwhelmed. Now, the United Nations Security Council threw UN troops against the aggressors, consisting of 17 countries but dominated by American forces. General Douglas MacArthur took command, and the immediate help of the American 24th Infantry Division was able to save the last piece of South Korea, the Port of Busan. UN forces reinforced by the 1st Marine Brigade, the 5th Regimental Combat Team, and other units 
We're pressing an offensive toward Jinju. In mid-September, General MacArthur's offensive began. American troops landed near Inshan, 30 kilometers west of Seoul. And it is worth noting that, according to experts, this site was unsuitable for an amphibious landing. Now the North Korean army, despite having doubled in size, was taken completely by surprise and almost completely destroyed in the ensuing campaign. It lost Seoul, 135,000 of its number were taken prisoner, and 200,000 were killed. On September 30th, UN troops crossed the demarcation line. And less than a month later, on October 20th, UN forces paratroopers seized Pyongyang. Kim Il-sung was forced to flee to Sinwihu on the Chinese border, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is to say North Korea, basically ceased to exist. On October 21st, the 7th Regiment of the 6th South Korean Division even found itself on the Yalu River, right on the border with Mao's China. At that moment, the war seemed to essentially be over. However, Four days later, the Chinese People's Liberation Army, led by Lin Biao and then Peng Tewai, marched on Korea. This attack was supported by Stalin, and it completely surprised the Americans, who considered any involvement from China impossible. Now MacArthur, at a meeting with President Truman on October 15th of 1950, had claimed that these threats were a giant bluff. How surprised the veteran general must have been, well, we can only suspect. Faced with a huge numerical disadvantage, 500,000 Chinese against 200,000 UN troops, Allied forces withdrew to the pyeongchek samchuk line, even evacuating Seoul on January the 14th of 1951. However, the city was recaptured three months later as part of Operation Ripper on the brink of the World War. The world was on the brink of World War III. There is no doubt about it. The United States took a much more resolute stance, and at a press conference on November 30th of 1950, President Harry Truman threatened the use of nuclear weapons. Dwight D. Eisenhower was even reinstated as NATO Commander-in-Chief, and suddenly everyone in America regretted the galloping pace of their post-World War II demilitarization. Although the American plans as a result of a possible U.S.-Soviet war were simply to bomb the USSR, only 100 nuclear bombs were then ready out of the estimated 300 required. Now, the Soviet Union did not look on passively during all this. Stalin concentrated five divisions on the Korean border. And at the same time, the actions of the West were paralyzed by peaceful means. The Kremlin-led World Peace Council launched the Stockholm Appeal, condemning nuclear weapons, which was signed by 500 million people worldwide. Now, a similar attitude was adopted by the World Peace Congress, held in Warsaw between November 16th and 22nd of 1950, which supported its appeals with the testimonies of prisoners from the UN troops. These men, who were subject to elaborate torture by the Chinese and so-called brainwashing, spared no details about the cruelty of Western troops. Now, in the shadow of all of these major events, on October 7th, 1950, China entered Tibet and forced the 14-year-old Dalai Lama to sign a treaty integrating the country into the People's Republic of China. American diplomacy through all of this was rather sluggish. The greatest supporters of an active crackdown on communism were led by General MacArthur, who on March the 24th, 1951, demanded help for Chiang Kai-shek in the event of an invasion of Asia. The general also demanded the launch of a nuclear attack on Manchuria, which would paralyze communist China. He expressed open opposition to the so-called limited war, believing it to endanger the lives of his soldiers. He used to say, quote, We are fighting for Europe here armed, while diplomats are still fighting only with words. If we lose the war against communism in Asia, the collapse of Europe will be inevitable. And if we win, Europe will avoid war and remain free. We have to win. There is no substitute for victory. MacArthur's attitude caused quite a stir. President Truman, terrified of a possible intervention by the USSR, dismissed the rebellious general. Nevertheless, in the United States, the war brought about a radical change in the attitude towards armaments. 
By February 1951, American aviation production had returned to the level it had reached in 1944. And defense expenditure between 1950 and 1952 increased almost threefold, from $17.7 billion to $44 billion. A treacherous truce. On June the 23rd of 1951, Yakov Malik, the UN representative to the USSR, proposed peace talks. Held from July 10th, first in Kaesong and then in Panmunjom, they did not stop further fighting along the 38th parallel, during which time more than half of the soldiers killed during the entire war died. The negotiations were made more difficult by the case of the UN POWs, who the Americans had no intention of handing over to anyone. Eventually, they were handed over to a neutral committee chaired by India. Now, the truce was signed on July 27, 1953. Negotiations had accelerated after Stalin's death back in March. The ceremony was held in silence, without the shaking of hands and without the participation of representatives of the first South Korean president, Ri Singman, who regarded the terms of the truce as treason. The security of the South was to be guaranteed by American troops from then on. The Korean War claimed millions of lives, but an exact number has never been verifiably established. But among them were over 33,000 Americans, approximately 520,000 North Koreans, 415,000 South Koreans, and 900,000 Chinese. The effects include, among others, the consolidation of the communist regime in North Korea. During the Geneva Conference between April 26th and June 16th of 1954, an agreement was envisaged to reunite the country of Korea. Ultimately, it was not concluded, and formally speaking, the Korean War has never actually ended. There's only a ceasefire. The Korean War showed the powerlessness of the United Nations, which, without US troops, constituted no serious force, thus giving the US full hegemony within the alliance. It was also the first war that presented the world with the real prospect of a nuclear exchange. Moreover, the war on the Korean Peninsula showed the importance of armed deterrence. Testing the world order usually takes place on the periphery of the main rivalry, and this is also how the status of the Korean Peninsula at that time can be defined. As mentioned, US troop numbers after World War II were massively reduced. This disturbed the balance of power, which the Communist Front decided to test. At that time, the Soviet Union was still the main adversary, but it played out this particular conflict from the back seat. After 70 years, the situation looks completely different. China is now the main adversary in the corridors of the Pentagon, and Europe is much closer to the role of the periphery than East Asia, which has recently become the gravitational center of the world. It was an episode of the Lessons of the Past series. Sometimes, in order to better understand the present, it is worth looking into the past. Meanwhile, as usual, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to the patrons who support this project. Subscribe, comment, and remember to leave a thumbs up. And I will see you in the next episode.